And there we go. Uh, great. Uh, so welcome everybody to today's uh, Spark webcast on subscribe to open and the open business model continuum. Uh, I'm Nick Shockey, Spark's Director of Programs and Engagement. Uh, and thrilled to uh, briefly open this uh, session that will be led by Rain Crow, Spark's senior consultant uh, and a pioneer of the subscribe to open model uh, and Moriana Garcia, uh, Spark's visiting program officer for open models who's been working closely with Rain uh, in, in this work. A uh, couple notes just at the beginning, we are recording today's uh, webcast. So just be cognizant of that in the discussion uh, and in the chat. Um, we have the Q&A functionality turned on for today's webcast and um, we welcome folks to ask questions at any point um, and use the Q&A function for questions. And we have it set up so folks can see other questions that are coming in and even um, upvote questions uh, that you would also like to see answered. Uh, it could also help uh, uh, with prioritizing questions uh, if we get uh, lots of them. Uh, we do plan to cover the questions at the end of the session, but again, feel free to uh, submit them at any point during uh, the presentation and uh, also feel free to uh, be active in the chat as well with any any comments uh, there. So chat for the questions and, or excuse me, chat for the comments uh, or sharing your own experience um, related to S2O uh, and uh, please use the Q&A for, for questions. Um, and with that, I'll just say uh, how excited we are to host today's program, uh, sort of introducing uh, S2O, uh, helping you know, folks on the webcast get a uh, sort of deeper background in the model and sort of how it works and compares to other uh, models. Uh, and really hope that this discussion and you know, sort of subsequent resources will be helpful in supporting libraries uh, and uh, you know, sort of adopting S2O journals as part of your collection strategies. Uh, and we'll leave it to Moriana and Raim uh, to go chapter and verse of the, the benefits uh, of the, the model. And with that, I will turn it over to Raim uh, to, uh, to introduce the, the session a bit more fully uh, and then turn to Moriana for uh, sort of the, the main presentation. Raim, over to you. Thanks, Nick. Um, and welcome everyone again to the Spark webinar on Subscribe to Open and its place in the Open Business Model Continuum. Um, as Nick said, I'm Rain Crow, I'm a consultant with Spark, where my primary focus is working with libraries, societies, and other nonprofit publishers to help them adopt sustainable models for supporting open resources. Today's webinar is going to look at open models in general, subscribed to open in particular, including the logic behind the design of subscribed to open, how it works in practice, and its implications for libraries. Our, the guide for today's uh, discussion will be Moriana Garcia. Um, Moriana is Spark's inaugural visiting program officer for open models, uh, a role that she works to increase library understanding and acceptance of non-APC models. As Nick said, Moriana is also the scholarly communication librarian at River Campus Libraries at the University of Rochester in Rochester, New York. And in that role, uh, Moriana supports the university community on issues relating to scholarly communication and open science. So with that, I'll turn things over to Moriana. Moriana? Hello, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm originally from South America, from Uruguay and Brazil. So, hola, bienvenidos. Um, I would like to add that none of this would have been possible without the fantastic support of the Spark team and all, all our library members. So, thanks to you all. Uh, as Nick says, we encourage you to tell us where you are coming from in chat and to add your questions at the Zoom Q&A and upvote the ones you like. We will have plenty of time at the end to answer them. So I'm going to start sharing my screen and we can go to the presentation. I hope you can see my slides. If you could confirm. So, um, yeah, they look perfect, yes. Moriana. They are perfect. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. You know, multiple screens. Um, so, subscribe to Open and the Open Business Model Continuum. That's the presentation of today. Um, and here is the outline 
First, we will give you a link to a short glossary with some terms and expressions with specific meanings in business parlance that we will use during the presentation. Next, we will spend some time explaining what we understand for open business models and the idea of the open business model continue. We need those explanations to place subscribe to open in that continuum. Then we will dive into S2O, discussing what problems is trying to resolve, describing the basic elements of an S2O offer, and that's subscribe to open. And finally, we will take a we will talk a little bit about the subscribe to open community of practice, which you are all welcome to join. Uh, we will address any lingering questions at the end. So um, we have this very short glossary in Padlet, which is publicly available at this link. We are adding the link to chat. Let me see if I can find my, my, my chat window. Um, no, I think once I share, but uh, I, I, once, once I stop sharing, I, I will put the link in chat, okay? I cannot see the, the chat in Zoom. Um, so, uh, but you, you can find the Padlet as this link. Uh, please add any other terms or expressions that you would like to see defined on the Padlet, and we will provide those definitions after. The glossary will allow us to have a shared understanding of those terms in the context of this presentation. Some of the terms can be tricky to define, so let us know if you disagree in the comments, and we can address that as well in Padlet. So let's start by describing open business models. And the business qualifier is important here, because when people talk about open models, sometimes they refer to very, very different things. So to understand, um, oh, open, uh, open models. To understand open business models, sorry, uh, we need to understand the concept of public goods. And the main characteristics of public goods is that nobody, nobody can be excluded from using the resource, even if they did not contribute to its creation. And that is known as non-excludable. Those resources are called non-excludable. A second characteristic is that the resource is not depleted by use. You can use it again and again, and it's still there. Everybody can use it at the same time, and this part is a bit tricky. The cost of distributing a second copy of the resource, which is known as marginal cost, is very low or zero. So it is not the distribution of the first copy. There is a cost to do that, which can be significant. But once you have one copy, the second one is easy. These type of resources are known as non-rival rules. Open resources have these properties, so they are considered public goods, which is great, but it may come with some challenges regarding funding. We all know that open resources are available to everybody to use and enjoy, but creating them has a cost, monetary or otherwise, on time, effort, etc. So how can we deal with that? Well, the approaches to funding open resources usually fall under one of these four categories or a combination of them. Taxation, and nobody likes taxation, but most public goods are funded through taxation. Freeways, defense, clean air, when it comes to open resources, taxes can pay for them through government grants, for example. You can charge APCs to grants, and some governments 
and covert agreements with publishers to fund open resources. The next approach is small groups. A few institutions can fund open resources based on their own interest because those resources serve their own needs. And they might must be small. So members can communicate directly and coordinate with each other to collaborate on the common project. This is a common model for open infrastructure. Another approach is collective action. In this case, groups of institutions fund open resources based on altruism or enlightened, enlightened self-interest. Oh, a tricky to pronounce. When you understand an enlightened self-interest is when you understand that you are part of a group and when the group benefits, you benefit with it. It is more effective and works better if it is an homogeneous group with cultural and social affinities, and with good communication channels. Two concepts, reciprocity and mutuality, are important for collective action. For example, you do this, I do that, or we both do this. It requires trust. The bigger the group, the more expensive to coordinate. Finally, we have private benefits, where institutions that contribute to create the open resource receive exclusive benefits only available to them. So it adds a market transaction component. There is a trade happening, and that reduces the need for altruism. Private benefits can be expensive to provide as well. What all these approaches to funding open resources have in common is that they all follow the same business model logic. So what is that logic? For a business to function properly, they require these four aspects working in tandem and creating a cyclical process where they feed on each other. First, there is value proposition. Define it as the content and services for which an audience is able and willing to pay. The more unique, the stronger your value proposition is. And that value needs to be very well communicated to the audience and demonstrated as well. Next, you have the audience itself or the clients, those who value the content and services and those who pay on their behalf. For example, libraries pay publishers on behalf of faculty and students. You may have different audiences or segments, each with different requirements, and payments are not limited to financial transactions. Authors, for example, pay with their creative work. And those payments become the income streams of the business, the next category, where the value proposition gets translated into resources, monetary or in-kind. You can have subscriptions, various fees, advertisement, grants, subsidies, licenses, et cetera, et cetera. The income streams support the core activities and resources that are required to produce and distribute the content and support the income model itself. How well this model flows defines how sustainable the business is. So recap, all businesses need a value proposition, an audience, income streams, and a set of activities and resources that allow them to create the value, a circle. And uh, what are the open business models that use, use that logic? 
Well, the first is hybrid, where the journal is available as a subscription, but authors can pay a fee, APC, to make an article open access. Sometimes those fees can be covered by institutional agreements. Hybrid journals usually do not have waivers. If you cannot pay, you go subscription. And most of the non-research content, the editorials, et cetera, remain gated. The next model is gold with APCs or BPCs, article processing charges or book processing charges. Publishing an article or a book requires payment of an APC or BPC unless you are eligible for a waiver. Sometimes fees can be covered as part of a membership or an institutional agreement. Usually, the entire journal content is open, even the non-research articles. Another model is conditional. When a journal is available as a subscription, but the current year content is made available open access if a certain condition is met. Conditional, a condition needs to be met. Usually a revenue target. If the offer succeeds, the entire content becomes open. In this model, the, there are usually exclusive benefits that are offered as an incentive to subscribers. Subscribe to open is a conditional model. Then we come to collective, where the cost of publishing is covered by contributions from multiple institutions. The amount of content may depend on the funding, but it is open from the get-go. Enlightenment self-interest is an important component of this model, as we mentioned before. Last but not least, we get subsidies, where the support comes from an institution or a small group of institutions. And it could be in-kind, it could be monetary, etc. The stability of those subsidies and the size are extremely important for the stability of the model, which it varies a lot between uh, publishers and, and, and journals. The thing is, you can place those basic open business models, those basic blocks, in what we call the open business model continuum. So here it is, which flows between market transactions and collective support back and forth. And there are some values that you can use to define where a particular model fits within the continuum. Market transactions are defined by exclusive benefits, by individual action and self-interest. On the other end of the spectrum, collective support is defined by the creation of social good. It requires coordination, sometimes a lot of coordination, and many times relies on altruism. Based on those values, this is how we tentatively place those models. The ones using APC, BPC are closer to market transactions. The other ones may require aspects of collective support. Of course, things can get a lot more complicated. Publishers may, may use one or all the models in their portfolio, or they can combine several of the models in one offer, creating a kind of chimera model with values that are all over the continuum. Nevertheless, I still find a simple model useful because it allows me to organize information in a way that helps when I must unpack a publisher offer. It is important to remember that these are all open models. 
they all create open resources and public goods, but they do it in different ways. If you think about open access publishers, it is easy to come up with examples for all the models. Many diamond journals, for example, use subsidies, although some are trying to incorporate collective aspects. Many hybrid journals are moving to gold or conditional. And in book publishing, we have several examples of combinations between conditional and collective. When it comes to library agreements or publisher offers, depending if the agreement has been made, you can use this model to go back and identify the basic open business blocks embedded in the offer. For example, annual reviews is one of the publishers offering subscribe to open journals. S2O, is a model used by several different publishers with slightly different offers, which can be tracked back to conditional. S2O is a variety of conditional, and we will learn more about S2O in a minute, don't worry. Another example are transformative agreements, which many times follow the read and publish model which is a variety of hybrid. For libraries, all the drama happens between the offer and the acceptance. When we have to evaluate if we want to sign a particular agreement, if it agrees with our values and principles and benefits our community. Evaluating library agreements is complicated. I think we all agree on that. It's, for me, it's like playing 3D chess. You need a multidimensional approach. You need to reach a balance between a desire for institutional support and a commitment to an equitable future. On top of that, sometimes there is an asymmetry in the amount of knowledge about open business models between collection librarians, SCOCON librarians, subject specialists, and administrators, and that only within the library. That is compounded by a lack of foundational knowledge among the scholars, and to culminate incomplete data. It is difficult to track the usage of open resources sometimes, and the metadata is still not there. For example, articles from gold journals, subscribed to open journals, and diamond journals, they all appear as gold in bibliographic databases. Well, this was just the introduction. <laughs> now we are going to dive in into subscribe to open, the focus of this presentation. Please, if you have questions, remember, add them to Q&A. Subscribe to Open is a good name, very descriptive, but it is long. So everybody uses S2O as a shorthand, as I have been doing lately. So S2O, subscribe to Open. So why S2O? What is the problem that S2O is trying to resolve that other models couldn't? And here is one of the reasons. Some of the problems are related to collective action issues, one of the four approaches to funding open resources. The main one, the main problem is the free rider problem. I hope you remember that there is no way to exclude non-contributors from using an open resource. They rely on others to provide something that they value. A free rider is a non-contributor who benefits from the resource, is able to contribute, this is important, it's able to contribute, but chooses not to. It is important to differentiate free riders from legitimate non-contributors, who are those who benefit, but are unable for different reasons to contribute. 
There are other issues of a more practical nature, just as identifying who should contribute, how much, and carrying on all the coordination that collective models require. S2O was created as a response to those collective action issues because it does not require altruism. It uses incentives instead. Besides the value on the content itself, you have private benefits, discounts, access to back files, etc., and those should be enough to motivate participation from contributors. S2O does not require coordination either. It is an individual decision. I may not know who else subscribes. But the current subscribers defined the target contributor group. Because by subscribing, you show that you already value the content. And it is easy to set up the contribution as the current subscription price. So it answers a lot of the practical problems uh, that we discussed in the previous slides. S2O is also an alternative to APCs. The reality is that APCs require a redistribution of costs from readers to authors. And for many non-profit journals, covering the average cost per article, what it costs to publish the article would require expensive APCs. In addition, for many disciplines, there is no research funding available that can be used to pay for APCs, those taxation funds. And perhaps the most important factor, there is a growing dissatisfaction with some of the inequities of APC models. They require a redistribution of cost that perpetuates some of the problems of the previous subscription model. If you cannot pay for a subscription, you probably cannot afford an APC either. So those are some of the reasons behind the creation of S2. So let's go through the basic elements of an S2 offer so we can learn to recognize them. In the original design, S2O offers were targeted to mature journals from non-profit publishers with stable subscription bases. However, the model is being tested on at least one new journal this year and has been adopted by some aggregators. S2O serves the self-interest of the subscribers through uninterrupted access to valued content and a series of private benefits. As mentioned before, it targets the current subscriber base of a journal, and it continues to use the same procurement process as before, so no change there. The model makes the current year or the next year, depending on the date of your contract, open access if a subscription or revenue target is achieved through the renewal of subscriptions. And the offer recalls annually. It happens again and again. The journals continues to be a subscription journal, but that particular volume becomes open access and available to all. If the target is not achieved, the volume remains gated and only subscribers have access. So these are the basics of an S2O offer. And here is a schema showing how the model works in practice. If you are a visual person, this can help. If you subscribe to an S2O journal, every year, the publisher will establish a revenue target that needs to be met for the journal to become open. If 
the offer is successful, first option, the current year volumes will be open to everybody. All articles will be open access. But what happens if the offer is not successful? Then only subscribers will have access, like a regular subscription. But what if you have a funder mandate or an institutional policy and you publish an article on the journal that has to be open? In that case, it will depend on the publisher and the mechanism they use to open content. Some S2O publishers offer an open access publish guarantee so articles from subscribers are published open access, even if the journal remains closed through that quarantine. Other publishers require an APC to publish your article open, similarly to a hybrid journal. And finally, most S2O publishers have green open access options that you can use to deposit your manuscript. So in sum, the outcome change depends depending on the conditions. You may be aware that there is a um, subscribe to open community of practice that you can show it, join if you are interested. The subscribe to open community of practice meets monthly and it has now more than 100 members. It congregates publishers, librarians, consultants, aggregators, funders, and scholars, all interested in learning more about the model and working together to discuss challenges and to learn from each other. If you Google, subscribe to Open is probably the first link. I have been a member for more than a year and volunteer for the communications committee. The purpose of the community is to make easy for others to adopt the model and implement as two principles. Because each publisher can have its own flavor of S2, the community also discusses what are the sustainable practices that make S2 a good model to deliver open access content. I'm personally amazed by the trust and openness that bring the entire community together. As a librarian, I recommend the experience. So that's, that's all I have. And now we, we are happy to answer any questions. I understand there is a lot of information here and you may need some time to digest. So here is our contact information in case you think of something to ask after the webcast. Participants will receive the slides and the recording. I would like to remark that RAIN is the brain behind all these ideas. I am just the translator. Mm -hmm. And it took me a year to grasp this simplified version. So I hope I managed to give you a shortcut. So let's go to the questions. Um, I'm, I'm curious about the terms in Padlet as well. So we welcome your feedback. I will stop sharing. Thank you, Morana. Great. I like. Um, so let me see if we can go through some of the, the uh, questions. Um, somebody had asked about whether there's a list of um, S2O publishers, and uh, Ross Mounts of uh, Arcadia has been assembling one. I, I um, put that in the uh, Q and A uh, response. And check that out. And Ross tries to keep that list uh, up to date. You can also go to the, um, as Morana said, you can go to the Community of Practice site, um, but that includes all. Uh, participants. Um, let's see. Lisa was asking um, if uh, any of the models address the underlying issue of what different publishers consider the cost of publishing and the fact that there's not tra transparency in those um, um, Some of them do, some of them don't. Um, but subscribe to open, um, it doesn't. It doesn't attempt to be uh, transformative in the sense of um, um, fundamentally changing the underlying economic structure it's of, of, of subscriptions. It's basically um, revenue neutral from the publisher's perspective and um, cost neutral from the library's perspective. 
And that's one reason why the, the, the models are intended primarily for nonprofit publishers, for trusted publishers, um, as opposed to um, uh, commercial publishers that may be more um, uh, uh, aggressive in terms of uh, profit seeking. So that's, um, that's a good question. But some of the, you know, obviously APC models, um, you know, focus more on that, um, you know, cost per, per article. Um, and Ahead, just just to mention that there are some commercial publishers that have a few journals in the subscribe to open model. So e even them can be persuaded to, to test them. Of course, right. And then and it's of course for the for the subscribing library to determine that um that the value is there. And the idea behind one of the ideas behind subscribed open is you're targeting um existing subscribers who have already demonstrated that they value the content at, at the price they're paying. So it's you're not asking them to pay more. Um, it's basically a, it's the idea is that each library continues to pay for what it's paying for, and the, uh, the, the, there's greater social good because more of the content's opened up um, if they do so. Um, there was another um, the question was whether S two O is a conditional model, and that uh, yes, it is in the sense that um, um, S two O is contingent on the open access is contingent on there being the uh, continued upfront support of subscribers. So that's what we mean by conditional or, or contingent. Yeah, I, I agree. So subscribe to open is classified as um, conditional. However, there are some models that use a combination of conditional and collective, as I mentioned, some of the book models. Um, so, so although they are conditional, they, they create a community to um, fund. Mm -hmm. no, this is great. This description. Right. And and Roger asked the um the question related to that is whether it's you know what we we're just saying. It's it was really um S2 is designed designed for um nonprofit, you know, um library friendly, if you will, publishers. Um that but at the same time there are commercial publishers, but they can be smaller um publishers and more academy friendly publishers that have that have adopted the model. Um and Marcel had asked about the um, do the private benefits of S two O include um, back files or engaged, and often that's the that is the case um, because it's, it's we um, we need um, a sufficient motivation uh, for libraries to continue to subscribe. So the contingency of the open access is, is one um, um, uh, inducement to participate. At the same time, the, the, the more uh, value you can provide this exclusive um, subscribers, um, the stronger that offer is. And so that's you know um, one of the um, you know the levers we use to to um, motivate uh, continued support. Uh -huh. um, adding to that, some publishers, because uh, getting contracts that are multi-year contracts uh, increases the stability of the model. Some publishers uh, have offered um, to give uh, permanent access so some of those back files after some years. There are some uh, offers out there, usually on the books, that if you sign a multi-year contract, then you will have a ownership. At least you as a subscriber will have ownership of some of those uh, items in the back files. So each publisher creates its own flavor. So you really need to look at the offer and see what are the incentives, what is, are the conditions, what they are offering. And so when someone asked whether um, S12 publishers apply uh, Creative Commons licenses, and uh, you know, most of them do. Um, it depends on the publisher um, and, and often on author preference, which ones they, uh, um, they use. Um, whenever possible, to then to use CC BY. Um, but again, it, it's uh, uh, happens at the publisher level. Um, and Jennifer was asking about um, whether a there's an audit needed to see whether the uh, publishers cover their costs. Um, again, the way what that's how it's typically done is um, the it's based on the the, the publisher's current um, uh, pricing and uh, subscriber base. So there's no you know, change in the underlying economic structure. Um, but let me agree that um, most S2 publishers are, are very transparent. Many of them um, uses 
um, systems that, for example, um, Plan S um, uh, requires. Uh, so, so they they report um, the structure of, of of their their costs, and some actually go beyond that. Some of the society publishers in this two group actually report numbers, money. They report how much they, they make, how much it costs to publish their journals. They are very, very, very transparent, some of them. Um, someone asked, uh, what happens if a, a small offer fails one year and succeeds another? Um, and this is entirely possible. It's, the, it's part of the logic of the model is there's a chance for failure that um, uh, for the open content not to be um, with some other content, the current content not to be open. And again, that's part of the, the leverage needed to uh, motivate uh, subscribers uh, to continue to support the journal. Um, and what we would expect to happen um, is as, as suboptimal as that would be is over time, the fact that the offer um, might fail will keep um, subscribers participating and make it less likely to fail going forward. And so that's it's kind of the uh, the, the that the, the risk of it failing or the chance of it failing is actually again part of the logic and strength of the model. It doesn't seem like it when you think of maybe a checkered kind of pattern where uh, it's open some years and some uh, others not. But ideally, that wouldn't be the case, or in practice, it wouldn't be the case um, because uh, again, subscribers um, there would be the recognition that. Not subscribing, you might be able to get open access. Might get the content open would be dispelled by the fact that it failed um, in some way. Um, go ahead, Maria. No, no, I, um, I, I, I agree. That's that's the logic of the model. It, it functions, you know, with incentives, the attractors, and, and there are, um, you know, consequences if you decide not not, not to support the offer. Because the, the publisher needs a certain amount of, of revenue or, or money to, to to keep going. And I asked this to some of the two publishers, and, and they have some cushion on their money that allows them to publish a year, even if the offer doesn't um, go through, and but they are gated, but they are using that year to incentivize people to come back <laughs> to. to to, to the level of funding that they need to function. Remember, most of these publishers are non-for-profit, small publishers, and, and, and they work really on, 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 on the brink, some of them. So it, it is important to, to, keep, to keep the subscriber base participating so everybody benefits. Um, there are a couple of questions that are, um, are basically on the same, uh, same topic um, about um, what what's um, the criteria for value? Yeah, well, not this one. In terms of whether they uh, how are the cost targets set, or what's the conditional tipping point uh, for an open offer? Um, and you know, typically, what it's done it varies by publisher, but it's based on the um, on the current revenue um, uh, projected for the journal based on current subscriptions. So um, it's not trying to um, uh, you know you know grow the revenue. Uh, it's just trying to maintain the um, the current. Um, Trend of the revenue um, and based on the same subscription prices, the same um, uh, you know across often across tiers, which are you know um, um, you know meant to you know, make the, the, the participation more accessible. So that's what the uh, and so the cost of it, um, the, the publisher's cost don't really come into it; they're already baked into that to that revenue target. Um, I, I I can say that usually it's it's. Um... And uh, around 90, 98% of subscribers, they they work with very, very thin margins. So they, they need most of their subscribers, 98% or more, to, to uh, renew. Yeah, the targets are very high because um, for the reason more I was saying. Um, let's see, the, there's a question about whether the community of practice recommends any criteria for evaluating. Um, um, subscribed open offers and, and that's something we are um, um, working on um, and uh, there, are already, there are already a lot of criteria for these but we wanted uh, community practice wants to provide clarifying information on how subscribed open offers differ from say read and publish 
agreements. So we don't, you don't want to um, evaluate subscribed open offers on the same kind of criteria as reading publish agreements, which have a different kind of uh, you know, uh, economic logic to, to them all together. So that's what something that uh, um, we're working on. Um, go ahead. Just saying that uh, from, from a simple point of view, you, you will use the same mechanism that you use to uh, evaluate a subscription journal, which is mostly what is the value of that content to your community and, and, and the cost, for example. So um, I, I think starting to think, okay, this is a subscription journal I can evaluate as I uh, use some of the same mechanism. It is a good start, but of course, it also has the open access component, the game that brings uh, a, a public good that creates social good, and you can consider that as well. Um, Marana asks, um, what's the cost for um, for the publishers to implement technical barriers to keep non-subscribers from gaining access? And actually, that's not a that's not a Actually, a problem because these can mind these are subscription journals, so they already have mechanisms to um, limit access to subscribers. Um, where there's this an additional um, uh, work or administration is providing access. Well, you're opening access to every, everyone else. Um, if you have um, uh, often the offers will provide um, again provide access to back file content, so they'll open up the front list but um, keep the back file gated, and that needs to be managed. But there the systems already already accommodate that. Um, and let's see, um, and there's a question about whether um, um, whether the, the published uh, uh, articles are allowed to be, you know, um, put in repository. Um, and yes, I mean, they're basically, once they have a, a Creative Commons license on them, you can treat them like if it's a CC BY license, it's, a, it's an open article, you can put that, um, um, you know, wherever, wherever you want. Um, However, if if the the offer doesn't succeed and it remains uh, a subscription journal, then then it's gated content, and you will have to use a uh, deem open access options. Um, uh, as I mentioned, when the offer doesn't succeed, you if it has an OA guarantee, then the article will be uh, open if you publish. If not, APCs or the green options, but only if the uh, Offer doesn't success. Um, Sue was asked, um, subscribers know when the uh, target is met, um, and uh, if they're well, they if, basically if they come in late, would they be able to, um, yeah, not not contribute and uh, um, reuse the uh, the uh, the revenue elsewhere. The typically again, as Morian said, that the the target is very high. I mean, in terms of uh, so the chance, uh, the percentage of the revenue that needs to be reached in order for the content to be open is very high, which makes it far, very um, sort of very difficult to attempt to um, wait and see, wait and see if the content will be open. Um, so that's um, that's typically not a, a winning strategy. Um, but when the publishers typically do, they'll set a date. Um, you know, Jan you know, January 31st or February 1st is a, the cutoff date that allows the, the international um, subscribers to participate because they often need to can't make a decision until the actual current year, but it's got to be very early in the year. So this, you know, that's when the decision is made um, whether to open it. Um, so there's not a lot of time if, uh, to, you know, to try to finesse the offer. And I see we received a comment in Padlet. Thank you. We will address those. Uh, so we'll come back to, to see the answer in Padlet after. Um, someone asked, is uh, ESTO a short-term band-aid to the issues going on around the uh, rising subscription costs and restricted budgets, long-term solution? Um, is rely heavily, yes, um, rely heavily on the financial well-being of library subscribers. Yes, both of those things. It does not transform the economic logic of scholarly publishing. So, um, and so, um, but what it does do is to try to be pragmatic in terms of providing a, a route to open 
you know, current gated subscription journals um, that, that were, and for which APCs don't work, and to do that now. And, and there's a lot of content like that. And there's a lot of content that, um, where APCs don't work. So even if it's a short-term solution, however you want to want to define short-term, whether it's three years or 15 years, it's, it creates, um, without increasing uh, system cost, without increase, increasing local cost, it, it increases the amount of open content. So if there, there, there may be better ways. Um, and once those are um, discovered, they can be applied. But in the meantime, um, subscribe to open can be used to increase and get again increase the social value, social good um, at the same system and, and local time. I agree with Rain. We are in a transitional period. So in a sense, everything is transitional, it's, it's temporary. We don't know how, how long those solutions will work, but Right now, it's one I consider one of the best solutions in the market for those small publishers that are in this conundrum. They cannot use APCs. They need revenue to publish. And, and um, th this is a way to, to continue, to continue their operations and share the content openly, as Rain mentioned. Um, and Lu Luanne asks about, um... What does this look like from an author's uh, perspective? Um, and if I'm reading your uh, question correctly, it's basically um, um, you know, with an APC, um, a discretionary APC, they pay it, or a regular gold APC, they pay it, they know their contents, but their article's going to be open. Um, with S2O, it's conditional. So how are they, they sure? Which, how are they sure? Um, in some cases, wherever it's possible, um, uh, S2O publishers will use what's called an open access guarantee. Where they make, um, um, they guarantee that any um, author that's affiliated with a um, subscriber is able to publish their um, um, article open access. The reason for that is it, it provides another compelling reason um, for subscribers to participate, um, which means the chances of the uh, author succeeding, which means the chances that um, all authors will be able to publish open. So that's that's what happens there. Um, but you're right, there is, a, and also some publishers. At the same time, use uh, green um, self archive self archiving um, policies to to accommodate um, authors that need to publish, for example, under mandate. So there are ways to address that, so it's not, you know, so it, uh, reduces the uncertainty. Um, and then J Jennifer asked about um, will S two O apply to Wiley, Elsevier, or Springer? Um, nothing says it won't. But at the same time, that, that means uh, the idea is that um, A, they would have to adopt it. Um, and they haven't, haven't had it yet. And would um, libraries accept, be it as open to accepting this kind of um, uh, uh, deal with a commercial publisher that has um, you know, higher margins and higher prices? That's um, the library. Yes, I, I so I think that. Commercial publishers can use the model. The model was developed to support non-for-profit, non uh, small academic publishers. That's, that was the original target, but this is expanding beyond that. So they could, but I'm not sure if they will buy into the ethos of the model that is really not to increase the, the, the price. Remember, it uses the, the current price on um, being transparent. So if they want to use the model, are, are, are they gonna <laughs> use the, the ethos of the model? So uh, as Rain said, hmm, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, I, I, let me see if I have to check the uh, very more open question. Um, and um, in chat, we we have some comments. Someone that wrote an article, <laughs> how much they like the model. So that's that's perfect. Thank you. And um, I think we 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 have covered everything, Rain. I think we went through all the questions. Okay. Well, and we're getting towards the MBA on um, our in any event. So we'd like to. I guess I was going to. But to thank you all for um, uh, participating and for listening. And please, if other questions occur to you, uh, please 
um, send Mariana or myself a um, an email. We'd be glad to uh, answer it. Um, and uh, um, and we will answer the Padlet questions or uh, comments in Padlet. So so bookmark that that link so so you can find find it again. Sure. Sure. So thank you everyone. Thank you for attending.